Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CS10 Lecture 19. Woo! Oh boy, that was very timid. OK. Uh, today we're talking about higher order functions part two. We had a lot of fun doing higher order functions part one last lecture. Uh, technology in the news, we're talking about the news item was ooh, game theory. And the idea, we talked, we've seen computational game theory, we saw that lecture. And we also saw that some games can be solved, small baby games like tic-tac-toe, and even going up to big games like Connect Four, but you certainly can't solve games like Go or chess. Or can you? It turns out that uh, the, so there are some researchers who have decided to try to strongly solve a particular opening. And the way they do that is not the technical way we strongly solve games. Normally, what they do is they run their kind of evaluation of whether this is a good position or bad position, and then try to make good moves and evaluate that. And whenever someone has, is down by what they consider 5.12 points, so basically two major pieces. If you're down by two major pieces, it's considered a loss for you. 99.99 is like 12 nines or something like that. But they say, like, if you're down by two pieces against a perfect opponent, you're not coming back unless you have this really rare special case. So by doing that, you can eliminate a whole tree. Once that's happened, you can say, you know, we don't need to actually play that game out. Once you're down by two pieces, the game is over. So they stop. And what they've done is prove that this really interesting opening called the King's Gambit, which is e4, e5, f4, and then e takes f4. So you're left with this little weird thing where, like, wow, you're going to give up a piece that early? That is a gambit which usually has some interesting ramifications, but uh, Bobby, uh, Bobby Knight, Bobby Knight's the basketball coach, Bobby Mc Fisher, thank you, I was a quiz, Bobby Fisher, I was thinking Bobby McFerrin, that's not Bobby McFerrin, Bobby Fisher said that this was, a, this was a bust, that it really wasn't good, and in fact that they proved that, that it really is a bust, there's only one move that is a draw for white, the rest of them are losses, so it really is a bust opening move, don't do the king's gambit, and it was, and they say, strongly solved or proved, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's proved to the 99.9999999 case, but it's pretty strongly proved. It's pretty cool. And they used 3,000 cores on this massive cluster to do it. Really cool stuff, all connected to our lecture on computational game theory. So I just figured that was in the news and share that with you. So today, we're following up on higher order functions. Let's jump right in. So we, in review, we saw that there are, shh, a higher order function is one that takes in a function as input or returns a function as output. We saw three common patterns for these higher order functions. Map, uh, keep, also called reduce, and combine. Uh, keep, also called filter. Combine, also called reduce. Sometimes we'll slip and say that. Um, here's the picture for that. We saw all three examples. What I want to do is we didn't get to do the acronym example. So let me give you a problem and see if you can, by composing functions in this space, think about the following problem. I'm going to give you a sentence a sentence that you just type out into a BYOB uh, text block that says, I don't know, the University of California at Berkeley or United States of America. Um, and what com should come out of the block you're going to write is the acronym for that, UCB or USA. Okay? So how could we use map, keep, and combine to get to that? So without me telling you, let's just see if we can do that now, in real time. You tell me how you would start with a sentence, the University of California at Berkeley, and how do you get to UCB? Let's assume it's all lowercase, just to make things easier. Now, you're going to say, well, Dan, these things don't operate on sentences. They operate on lists. So the first thing you're going to need to do is say sentence to list of that. Okay, so now you get a list where each of those words is in a different element in the list, okay? The University of California at Berkeley. Can you tell me which of these three, you do, which of these three high, common higher order functions you would do next to get to the answer? Keep. What would you be keeping? Keep the small ones or keep the non-small ones? The non-small ones. Exactly right. So keep. All of a sudden, after that, keep or filtering operation, you're left with University, California, Berkeley. Awesome. That's a great intuition, and you're exactly right on that. So now, how do we take that and get to the next stage? What, how, what else would you use up here? Map next. 
So that would kind of cascade. We call this a data flow. Right, this, or not. this is a data flow problem where kind of stuff pulls in the top, and then it kind of gets filtered or done something to here, and then the output of that gets done something to there, and the output of that gets done something to there. We kind of pipe it into each other like a big set of pipes. In the operating system Unix, that's how the whole thing works, is you, set, you pipe things together. You first take a file, and then you duplicate it, and then you cut this element, and then you strip it, and then you sort it, and you, all these things, you kind of pipe them together in a data flow model. So write down data flow, that's important. So after you've got a keep, I heard somebody say something for the next step, which is a map. That's right. Tell me how a map would work. What would the map do? Take the first letter of whatever each of those things were. I love it. What's the output of map? Is it, does this, the length of the list get any smaller or bigger? Stays the same. So you have University of California, Berkeley. Now you have a list of UCB. I love it. What else would you use to close it, to take us on home? Combine. Yeah, what would you use combine for? Remember, combine takes a binary function. So what would you use in the combine argument? Join. That's it. So it's really beautiful that you end up having, here's this sentence. The next step is that has to get transferred to a list. Then that, so it's like a process of that. Then that has to go through a keep operator, operation. Then that has to go through a map operation, and finally gets to a reduce, and you're left with a beautiful thing. Turns out that that actually comes for free in the tool sprite. So let me, without having to actually lose time on this and try to do this, I want to get to some other really cool things. Let's jump right into there because you have this already in your hands. Anybody who has run, BYOB, BYOB running has the tool sprite and has the answer there. So let's do that. It'll take a second to load, and we're going to now take a look at how that works, and we'll see if that. Makes sense. Exactly what you said. We'll see if it kind of makes sense of what we've, how we've done it. And we'll, ta we'll take a look at that. There's a si you already remember that there's, um, there are uh, the gray borders. Remember the gray borders mean? So if we do it here, here's map, keep, and combine already in the tool sprite. Uh, sprite. If you look at the scripts menu for that particular sprite, normally you delete that. But if you keep it, here's what you get to see. And here is, and I'm going to zoom, zoom in here. This is the solution. Now, it looks a little weird, but let's start from the innermost guy. Okay? Keep such items such that from, from what? From sentence to list of University of California at Berkeley. I can even add that and add a the in front, and that'll still work. Now, you're keeping what? The non-small words. And there happens to be a really wonderful block that comes for free also as part of the tool sprite, which is something, i.e. a list, contains this element. It's a way to check if a list has that second argument anywhere in the list. Like if I have a list of all my animals that I own, I own chickens and dogs and fish, I might say, do the animals I own, do I own a fish? So rather than have to, you write your own block, is this a fish? No. Is that a fish? No. Is that a fish? No. This comes for free to check if my list has a fish. It's kind of like a set operation. That's, here's a set of things I have is what I'm asking you in that set. And so here's what's interesting. The way we do it is what if we have a list of all the small words, all the articles, right? And now I say, does this list contain each of the words here? But, it's, but that would keep only the small words. You want to throw away the small words. So you know what we do? We wrap it with a not. Isn't that interesting? So keep the elements that are not in this list. That's, when you say it in English, it kind of makes sense, right? I'm going to go through those words, and for each word, I keep the words that are not in that list. Isn't that cool? And that just works. So the result of this is a list of University, California, Berkeley. Now let's, go, let's grow bigger next. The next bigger encompassing function is map. And someone said, just take the first letter of each one of them. And we have letter argument, letter N, of the word or a sentence. So right there, letter one of blank. So that takes the first letter. That goes through each of those three words. University of California, Berkeley returns a list of University of California, Berkeley. We love it. The last one is combined with the join. The join just comes for free. Drag it over from the operator's menu, and there's your combiner. And then if we wrap the whole thing in a say block, then you can ask, this sprite, which is actually a picture of this title here, I can ask this sprite to say it. So if I go over here, and if I go down to the bottom, and I double-click this, 
UCB is shown there. Oh, and it says it for two seconds. That's kind of annoying, so I'll make it for 10 seconds. But it works. And so that is a composition of functions. And we're really, really happy that that's a really nice example that tests all of the three major ones. Isn't that great? So the next thing I was going to do is show you for each. Now, one of the things you know that map takes a list and calls a function for each of the elements of that. And the cool thing about that is it just works. You don't have to worry about it. It returns, map returns a new thing. Okay? For each is the way that you address a command. If I want to say here, here is a list of things I want to say. Hello, CS, and 10. And I want each of those things to be said by my script, by my sprite. Well, wrapping around the script doesn't do that for me. How, how could I go through that list and do something to it? Kind of map is the wrong thing because you're not returning something new. Map's uh, job is to return a three element list where something's done to everything. But that's not supposed to be a side effect. It's supposed to be a kind of manipulation of the word hello in some way, like count the length of it or find the first letter of it or something. But if you want to do something to the, each of those things in the list, which is really often what people will want to do, like say hello to all the people on the high score list, and you say congratulate. Send mail. I mean, think of all the things you do in real life. Send mail to all the winners of the Mega Lotto. That is, do the action to this following people in this list. Here's a list of all the people who submitted to the Lotto. Keep those that won the Mega Lotto, three people. For each of those people, Send a message saying, you know, send Ed McMahon to their house and say, congratulations, you won with the TV crew. Where are you going? Disney World. So here is a for each. And what you do in for each is just like you did in map and keep and reduce, you're going to leave a little blank there. And that blank gets filled in by the element. So let's try it. Let's watch my sprite over here. Maybe I'll do this here and scroll back down. Okay. So let's watch. Here's my for each. Watch my main sprite. And, uh, yes, hello, CS10. Very, just exactly as you'd expect. Each one of those list items got handed to say for one second, and one by one it said them for one second. Kind of useful, really, really useful. Okay? Now, that is, and by the way, there's a number here, so you could actually do this and actually pull this in there and watch what happens when you uh, say... Uh, watch this one. I'm going to do something here. Say this, and I'll put a little blank in here, and say blank uh, with a number right after it. Watch this. And what's it going to do now? Hello, 1, CS2, 10, 3. So that's kind of a nice way. If, this were, if my list were a list of high scores, I could see using the number very naturally. Congratulations, mega winner. You are winner number, number sign. One. And so that's kind of useful to use the number sign, kind of more so than the map, right? The number sign can be useful for doing the four. What we've done so far is we have talked about functions that were carnivorous fish, the sharks of the world. They are functions that take other functions as input. They eat other functions as input. But we have yet to talk about pregnant fish. How do you make a function that returns a function? Okay? Let's do that today. Okay? Right now. So... There's one that comes for free in your tool sprite, okay? It's called Compose, and it's really cool. Here's what Compose does. I'll go back to the, this thing. Compose says, take function one, take function two. Return a mega function, which is function one, called on function two, called on whatever. Function one was a function of one input. Function two is a function of one input. And what it does is it says, let's compose them together, a composition like you saw in your, like we saw for acronym, like we saw in your midterm, that says return a new function that is function one of function two of whatever you give it. Isn't that cool? And you can either save that, you can say either a variable equals, that set my new composition function to be the return value of that composition, and then you'd call that, or you could just call it directly like that by using the call block. You want to try it? So you can see how useful this is in this perfect example, which is I have the sentence build your own blocks. Okay? There is an operator called first word of. That's great. 
And if I were to call this, I would get build. If I just get first word of that, that sentence. I also have an operator that says all but the first word of, which basically throws the first word away and leaves me with the remaining. But if I want to have an op I want to have what's the second guy in that? What's the second word in that sentence? One way to do that would be let's throw all, let's throw the first guy away, leaving your own blocks, and now let's take the first guy of that, and that's your. That's the way to get the, the second guy there. So how can we do that by a composition of functions? Well, so let me just show you, let's just prove to ourselves that that actually works, okay? Let's do that here, all but first word of, just to show, prove that this all works, first word of, and then this, I go here, and I copy, and I say all but first word of this, I paste, say if I do this, I get your own blocks. And now if I put this in here and compose that in there, it is your. So that's what I want, okay? Watch how cool this is. I am setting second not to be a value in the traditional sense of value of a number or a word or a sentence. It's being bound to a function. Compose returns a function. So now second is as if I had gone into make a block that has an input and does the first of, the all but first of, its input. It's as if I did that. But dynamically, I am creating a function that compose is a pregnant fish. It is returning a new function. You are binding second to that new function. And now how do I call it? Look, call second with input that. And what do you get when you do this? Let's watch my, let's watch this sprite because the sprite with the yellow guy is going to be reporting your. And you can see there's a smart, tiny little your over there. Okay? That's awesome. That's really awesome. So let's think about that. That allows me to not have to create all the functions manually by saying make your own block. The idea that you could dynamically make a function that you needed and return it right there is really cool. For example, we talked about, we'll go back here. We talked about sorting last time. Sometimes you want to sort by, by what? By smallest, by largest, by closest to four. You could have a block which talks to the user, okay? Asks the user, what do you want to sort by? And it returns, not a number, but it might parse some human input. The user might even say it by speech. I would like to sort by the smallest value first. And you do some WYSIWYG magic in the background to figure out that what they want is the less than block. And that reports the less than block. If the user happens to say, I want to sort by numbers that are closest to four, that would report the closest to four block. So you can imagine that being really powerful, but, but abstracting away the job of talking to the user and figuring out what they want to sort by, and its job is to report the block that you sort on. That input gets stuffed into the argument of the sort guy, and it just works. Remember how we saw that you sort by four and you sort by the gray border around less than, the gray border around greater than? You can imagine dynamically figuring out what function to sort on and returning that, and that going in that slot of sort based on this thing on this list. So that's a really powerful example of why we might use a dynamic anonymous function creation, where you can write a function on the fly like that. So, um... Here's, here's Compose. Do you want to see how Compose works? Sure, right? Let's, take, let's, take, let's actually go down a little bit and see how Compose works. So here's Compose. Look how simple it is. It's actually so, so beautiful and so elegant. Compose takes two functions, two unary functions, f and g, and what's it doing? It's calling f on g, on blank, and returning that block. What would happen if I didn't put the block around it? It would try to actually call right there F on G and do something. That's the, not the right thing. It's supposed to return the block that is the equivalent of F on G of blank. Pretty cool. Let me show you how we could use Compose in an interesting way. Okay? And this is the kind of thing that is really cool. Look at this. Cascade six times the following function on an input. And so you see the, the comment is, you mean 
f of f of f of f of f of the input. So you can imagine, here's an example in real life. Um, people take an original AIFF file ripped from a CD, and you might MP, MP3ify it, right? And what if you then somehow treat that as an AIFF file, and then MP3 again? Like, if you keep adding this codec to it, how does the sound change? What, what does the sound become? Does it all of a sudden sound like an AM radio? And it does. If you actually keep mp 3 ifying in a dumb way by taking the MP3 and kind of making it AIFF without doing something special, you keep applying the same codec over and over and over to it to see what happens. You can do it in Photoshop. Let's do a blur on this image. Now you get a blurred image. What if I blur it again? What if I blur it again? That's what this F of F of F is. Do the same operator over and over and over and over to see what happens. So Cascade is really cool. It just says take a function and do it over and over and over to see what happens to it. It's kind of cool. Okay, so let's look at this. What does this do? So uh, this is of one. Let's 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 take the number out of it. Let's do here and let's put it of let's say two and times. Uh, let's do ten. Okay, let's try it here. Okay, what is this going to do if I put this here? Let's try a simple one here. So this is the doubling block, right? And it says. Take 10 and then double it, 20, and then double it again. That's the second time, 40, and double it again, 80. You see that? So let's try it. 80. Isn't that cool? So the idea that functions can be treated like data allows you to do this really cool thing, which is like, here's a function, do it like 100 times. Do it enough times until you converge. How about this? Here is a Google Maps problem. You have a Google Map. And you have, um, you know, the Google Street View allows somebody to drive down the street and get pictures of all the sides and there's people and there's, and there's license plates and there's that. You want to blur the faces out. So you might want to cascade the blur faces until you can no longer discern who they are, right? Apply a blur on the face. Oh, okay, kind of blurry, but I can still see that's Dan. You want to keep blurring it until it's, until it's blurred. So you might want to cascade until some condition is met. Right? You want to um, squash down the file smaller and smaller until, you know, at, at, as small as I can get until, it's, I, I can, until I start to hear the artifacts of that compression. Right? I can think about, there's all these cool things you can do if you kind of think about Cascade in a more general way. Let's see how Cascade works just for fun. So here's Cascade, and it might be a little bit complicated, but let's see if we can work through it or if it's worth it. Hey, not too bad. Look at this. Okay. Let's think about it. What's it doing? It's just f of f of f of f in some number of times. How many times? Num times. Okay? So watch this. Of, and start is the first input. Okay? Start is the value you're kind of doing it on. Okay? So, this says, by the way, I'll show you this one. This is not, if you look at this cascade, cascade is not a pregnant fish. It's not returning a function, it's returning a value. It's not like compose. Compose returned a function. A meta function, this composition function. Cascade doesn't. This returns a value that's a little easier to, to read because you're talking about numbers, not functions you're doing, right? You're not passing around functions all the time. So what does Cascade do? Well, it's easy. Start starts with, with our 10, right? Result. Set result to start. So result's 10. Number is 0. Remember, like, this is the way I do it before. Number is 0, and then I repeat number times. Change it by 1. This could really be the for loop. There's a nice for loop that we have that comes with, with um, BYOB to do that. Look, set result to call function with inputs result. So result gets getting overwritten by calling function over and over on it. So repeat this times what? Result starts at 10. Double result. Now that's 20. That's the first time. Then do it again. Repeat again. Now it's 40. Now do it again. There's your 80 and you return report result. So it's actually, this is a lot easier to understand than the compose thing, which is returning the function with the script and all this stuff, okay? Kind of cool, right? When you kind of play in this function land and functions are just data. This is a powerful, folks, people around the country are graduating with CS degrees who don't have an appreciation that functions can just be data. They think, oh, no, 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 all the languages I've ever seen, like C and C++, blah, 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 it makes it very hard to pass in a function as data. So functions are over here, and data's over there, and they don't know. You tell, you tell people who are graduated from good schools, can you write Cascade? They say, no, you can't write Cascade, because you can't just put in a function as data. 
But in this beautiful language, which is a variant, which kind of is really scheme at its heart, and that really has the power of lambda. Lambda, by the way, I don't know if I've said this, lambda is what we call the block. The idea that you are wrapping things in a function, that functions are themselves data, that you are able to dynamically, anonymously make a function right now is called lambda. And if you are ever wondering what that little doohickey is on the top of Alonzo, Isn't that a beautiful homage? Isn't that a beautiful homage to lambda? That's the Greek symbol for lambda, if you didn't know. Okay, so, all right, so that's Cascade. All right, with five minutes left, let me show you this cool thing that we decided to do in the bottom. Really cool, crazy stuff. What if, let's just, let's just, let, me just let me just go rogue for a moment. What if I had a list, and the list is not being shown, even though it's saying it should be shown. All right, good, here we go. What if I have a list of three functions? In fact, if I would, what, if, what if I have a list of n functions? And what I want to do is, how about this for an awesome exercise for the reader? Take this list of functions and write a function that takes a list of functions, starting to get a little brainy here, reports a meta function, which is the composition of all those things. So you take it, so it's a function that takes an input, adds three to it, then it doubles it, and then it squares it. Let's try it. So this is, in this example, let me scroll to the bottom here, evaluate the compound function, which is functions, okay, with the value zero. So evaluate is actually, remember the word evaluate says that we're actually making you give me a value. So you're not kind of returning. This is not what I said I wanted to do. This is, this is the, give me the equivalent of call these three in order and give me the value. And in some sense it's the same as cascade, right? Which is like just do that one over and over and over. But it's cool that you have, in advance you have no idea how long functions is. It's kind of more general than just here's an input, input function, do it six times or just a number of times. It is take this list and do it. So. What if you call functions on zero? What would you get? So zero plus three, oh, I'll make it bigger now. Zero plus three, three. Double three, six, square six, 36. So let's try that. Let's see if I get 36 over here. Okay, boom, boom, 36. Okay, let's make it one. Let's see if I have this here. And my list is one plus three, four, double four is eight, square eight, 64. Let's see if it works. Bam, 64. Bam. So how do you do this? The same way as compose, right? You just kind of do that over and over. We can look at it, and you'll see it's almost exactly the same as compose. If you look at this, it's almost exactly the same thing. Look at how easy this is. Like four, it's like four lines, OK? You start with a value. You set the result to value. The result is like the answer. And then you just, for each function of functions, call function with input result and set the result to that. So it's the same as before, OK? So thanks, folks. That's Hired of Functions.